Father, we have wild hearts. This is not something we are denying. We aren't covering it up. We have a heart problem. We have a secret motive to eye our name in all we do. We hunger and hunt after man's approval and applause. We would rather be seen of men than seen of you. We don't need you to tame our hearts. We need you to give us a new heart. We are living in the already but the not yet. We face the tension of hating sin, but at times loving it too. Our sins are crucified but never fully mortified. Even our prayers are stained with sin. So we repent of our repentance. We need even our penitential tears washed in the blood of Christ. Of all hypocrites, grant that we may not be evangelical hypocrites who sin more safely because grace abounds, who love expository preaching and theological singing but live unholily, who say amen but whose private life would make others say, oh my. Who excuse our sin of anger by blaming it on others' slowness. Who excuse our sin of gossip by saying it's just venting. Who excuse our neglect of your word by saying we're too busy. See, Lord, we have a heart problem. And it will stay that way unless your word does what your word does. We need you to go to work in us. We need you to slice us and dice us to remove the affections for sin. We need your word to melt us that we might be molded into the image of your dear son. God, our greatest need is to see our need of you. Help us to feel the need of your continued saviorhood. And cry with Job, I am vile. With Peter, I perish with the publican. Be merciful to me, a sinner. What we need in this hour is beyond what a mere man can supply. Would you please be gracious to us and make the book live among us? There is in this auditorium a spiritual battle going on for the attention, the minds, and the hearts of those listening. There is more going on here than meets the eye. So we need unseen help. Spiritual aid for a spiritual battle. We stand in awe of your otherness, your holiness. We confess our sinfulness, our transgressions. We come to thee for forgiveness, for cleansing, for removal. We have great sins, but we have a greater Savior. We plead the blood. Church, before I end this prayer and you lift your heads, would you right in your seat pray this silently? God, my heart is an idol factory. Reveal my heart's idols today. Show me an idol and I will crush it. Show me a sin and I will repent of it. Show me mercy and I will cling to it. Father, this is not merely the prayer of the sheep in this room. This is also the prayer of the shepherds in this room. This is our corporate prayer. Amen. We preach through books of the Bible at FFC. Verse by verse, week by week. And we are currently in the book of James. Week one, the gospel according to James. Week two, affliction. In the school of Christ. Week three. Lord, we need wisdom. And today, week four, 
Trials, temptations, and the goodness of God. Trials, temptations, and the goodness of God. We will talk about trials, then temptations, then the goodness of God. Some of you are going through deep waters of affliction. Painful trials. You've been weeping for weeks. Unless something happens, you are going to collapse under the weight of this trial. Others of you, you are also in a trial, but you process differently. And you're putting one foot in front of the other, trudging along. It's just been a hard, unpleasant season of life for you. Some of you are going through trials, and some of you are facing temptations. Each day is a battle for you not to give in. Some are deeply entrenched in the waters of affliction. Some are deeply entrenched in some hidden sin. The answer for both of you is this. The goodness of God. The goodness of God. Now here's where we are going. Rest in this promise of scripture. Verses 12 and 13. Recognize your pattern of sin. Verses 14 and 15. Revel in the power of the sovereign. Verses 16, 17 and 18. Rest in this promise of scripture. Recognize your pattern of sin. Revel in the power of the sovereign. Now, you ferocious note takers, do not worry about getting all of this written down now. You are going to see this outline again. We're going to walk through them one at a time. Let's get after it. Verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test... He will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Blessed is the man. Jesus talked like this. James' big brother Jesus gave a lot of blessed is the man statements. They, they were called beatitudes. He gave a cluster of them in the Sermon on the Mount. James here gives his own beatitude. Blessed is the man, meaning here man or woman, man in the humankind sense. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. This is a statement of fact. This verse is a verdict. Happy is the man who withstands trials. Joyful is the woman who endures troubles. Does your theology teach you the beatitude that says, miserable is the man under trial. Dejected is the woman under trouble. That's not the biblical beatitude. We have a happy man in verse 12. He's blessed. A joyful lady in verse 12. She's at peace. This woman is blessed because the trial has produced an ability to handle life. She has developed a stick to itness, a spiritual toughness. This man is under trial, but he doesn't give in. He doesn't throw in the towel. He's running the course God has set before him. He's persevering in that health diagnosis. He's working through that marriage difficulty. He's navigating that challenging job disappointment. He's managing by the Spirit's power to stick it out. James is writing to many local churches scattered in the Mediterranean world. The people reading this letter were in the midst of trials. Their trials were just as broad as ours. Some large tragedies, some small hurts, some painful troubles, other small annoyances, some physical afflictions, others emotional battles. But all trials... No doubt people in these churches were enduring trials of miscarriage. Trials of betrayals from friends. Being conned out of money. Facing false accusations. Threats of being beaten. 
having lost a job because she took a stand for Christ. Death of a spouse. Death of a child. Unable to get proper medical care. Crooked attorneys letting the guilty go free. Someone being cold and dismissive toward them. A friend you love moving away. Physical persecution. Emotional distress from a broken relationship. Some actions of a family member ripping your heart out. It does not say, blessed is the man who is never afflicted. No, it's blessed is the man who patiently and triumphantly endures the affliction. The verse continues, for when he has stood the test. Now, that is not the end of the test or the end of the trial, but the end of your life. The thought here is that after being shown genuine, after being approved, he doesn't drop out. Instead, he gets the degree. Persevering through trials while holding tightly to Christ is one of the distinguishing marks of true faith. One of the surest evidences. True faith endures through hard times all the way to the end of life. The test is hard. You are holding the pencil, taking the test of trials, and tears are falling from your face onto the test paper. But you are going to finish. You face days where your knees buckle and your back hurts, but you keep going. God continues to move you forward in the Christian life. You say, Kyle, I feel like a quarterback in the pocket, and everything is closing in on me. Dear suffering saint, God knows how long to keep you in the furnace. And you will not be in there one minute longer than is needed. Verse 12 again. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. Those who endure trials, although not perfectly, but truly, will at the end receive the crown of life. If you hold fast to Christ while he holds fast to you, a crown is waiting. Now, what is this crown? This is an allusion to the Grecian games. Placed on the head of the winner of any athletic event was a crown of laurel or of ivy, or of, or of perhaps parsley. A laurel wreath. The victor's prize placed upon his head. Historically, that's what these crowns were. In later times, there were gold crowns for winners. So church, is James saying, if we endure trouble here, we will later receive a literal crown? If you seek literal bands of gold, your quest for crowns is mistaken. This is not some gem-studded headpiece. It's not like we can collect them all. Oh, I've got all six. This is not a literal crown. It is a symbol of eternal life. This crown is a picture of eternal life with God. That's the promise of Scripture. It speaks of eschatological hope, eternal life with Him. But this does not only go to the fastest person. It's not whoever runs best under trials wins. Whoever comes out of the trouble the strongest gets the crown. No, we are not in this race against each other. We are in this race with each other. You don't have to worry about winning this race. You simply have to concern yourself with finishing this race. Beloved, if you limp over the finish line, this is waiting for you. For all those who finish. No trials. No crowns. Without the test, there is no graduation. Verse 12 again. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, 
he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Crowns for all those who still love him coming out of trials. You come out loving him and there is a crown for you. In the midst of pain, we cling to him. The prime source of our endurance is not grim determination. It is love for God. Our progress to the crown is not expedited by our powers of endurance, but by the depth of our love for him. We don't grit our teeth and push through. We cling to his holiness and he brings us through. Your plan for your life and God's plan for your life are sometimes at odds. And so I ask you, if everything is stripped away, do you still love him? Do you possess a love that cannot be damaged or destroyed by trials? Do you love God? Only those who love him will endure. In trials, our heart is enlarged for him. In troubles, our love is deepened for him. I would have never chosen this affliction, but this affliction has awakened new affections in me for him. Troubles lower our pride. They foster endurance and mold us into the image of Christ. In affliction, God takes out the sandpaper and he goes to work on us. Here's a glorious truth. Jesus Christ has you as the subject of his prayers that you will endure. So James presents trials in terms of present and future implications. Present, blessed, happy, jubilant, joyful, elated, enraptured because we know God is perfecting us through this trouble. Present, blessed, future crown. It's a reward for finishing a race that God will give you the strength to finish. A prize for persevering in trouble when he will give you the needed endurance. We will wear a crown because we will hold fast to God as he holds fast to us. Jesus received a crown of death so that you can receive a crown of life. This is our glorious Savior. Rest in this promise of Scripture. God will try you. God will not tempt you. God will try you. God will not tempt you. God sends trials. God does not send temptations. James goes back and forth from trials to temptations because that's how we experience them, isn't it? On the hills of a trial is a temptation. One right after the other. Verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Let no one say, don't let these words cross your lips. Don't you dare say, God sent temptation to you. God will send trials, but never temptations. Don't play the blame game. Man is inclined to blame others for his sin and will even go as far to put his sin upon God. If God had given me a better paying job, I would be generous. If God didn't surround me with pagans at work, I wouldn't have to act like a pagan at work. If God didn't give me such a frustrating child, I wouldn't get angry and lose my patience. If God had given me a more loving husband, I wouldn't have to look to a movie or a novel to meet that romantic desire. 
Well, God put that person at the gym in my life. God didn't take that person away, so it's, it's really his fault that I fell into immorality. God gave me this weakness. He created me like this. I'm predisposed to this sin. It's God's fault. He gave me the desire. I must do this because I have the desire. If God had just changed something about my family, my environment, my education, my friends, I wouldn't have committed this sin. Friend, no one must say, God put temptation in front of me. You can't ascribe that to God. This verse simply records a common error. They did this 2,000 years ago, and we do this today. Our MO is to blame God, to fix blame upon Him. God didn't give me the ability to resist that sin. I asked Him, but He didn't give it. See, this is as old as the garden. When Adam was approached about his sin, he said, The woman whom you gave me, she made me eat. It's subtle, but did you catch it? God, the woman you gave me. I was doing just fine until you gave her to me. Adam proposes God was the party at fault. Adam would rather God be guilty than himself. You made her, Lord, and she is defective. Can I send her back? Is there a return policy? He's, he said that right in front of Eve. And he's got to live with her for the next 900 years. I, I wonder how many burnt casseroles he ate for dinner. <laughs> Two great American pastimes, the passing of the buffalo and the passing of the buck. But who would have ever thought that the buck would be passed to God? Now, there is a theological minority out there who say that everything is under God's control, even my sin. See, that's blaming sovereignty for your sin. God never solicits anyone to do what is morally wrong. God never acts under delusion or deceit. Verse 13 continues. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Let's stop here and let me give you a truth about God's character. A truth about God's character. God is untemptable by evil. Sin holds no attraction to him. God is untemptable by evil. Sin holds no attraction to him. He does not experience its draw. There's no vulnerability to evil. God isn't inclined to evil in any respect. He has no relationship to sin. He's untainted by it. God is not susceptible to temptation. He has nothing in his nature that is open for evil. Nothing for evil to grab hold of in God. He can't be tempted with the idea to tempt us. It's contrary to his nature, inconsistent with his purity and holiness. Sin is repugnant, abhorrent to him. Verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. God is sovereign over our sin, but he never seduces us to sin. God never, never, never invites us to sin, urges us to sin, creates an opportunity for us to sin. That's blasphemous. Being a good Reformed theologian, James wants to get this straight. Any theology that excuses our sin on God's sovereignty is from the pit of hell. God is as far removed from evil enticements as heaven is from hell. Tempted one? Tempted one? 
God is not fueling the fires of your temptation. God doesn't give anyone permission to sin. He never instigates sin. God puts evil in no one's way. He cannot be the cause of man's evil doing. Well, who is responsible then? Well, let me pull out a mirror. You are. After you commit sin, are you bowing before God or blaming him? Are you crying to him or charging him with fault? Rest in this promise of scripture. God will try you. God will not tempt you. Rest in this promise of scripture. Now recognize your pattern of sin. Temptation does not come from God. Do you know where temptation comes from? Verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. A true account of temptation is found in this verse. This teaches us about the nature of temptation and sin. James speaks universally. This is true of all men and of all women. This process is not uniquely different from person to person. In church, it's an absolutely revolutionary concept to understanding temptation. Absolutely a revolutionary concept to understanding temptation. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed. Lured and enticed, these two words in the original language are fishing terms. A lure is meant to deceive fish, to trick him into thinking he is getting a good thing, food, when he is getting a bad thing, a hook. Once he bites the lure, you set the hook, you reel him in, you have fish for dinner. I suspect James fished a bit. Sin entices. It tantalizes. It drags you away by dangling something attractive in front of your face. Verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Temptation doesn't come from God. It comes from within us. Genetics are not to blame. How you were raised is not to blame. Where you were born is not to blame. The fact that you didn't have money is not to blame. God is not to blame. God didn't give you that desire. Sin is entirely the responsibility of the sinner. It's an inner enticement, an inner lure. The trouble is within us. What is the origin of temptation? Us. The evil impulse comes from within. The fallen nature interacting with the fallen world produces this. Satan doesn't have to drag us to temptation. We drag ourselves to temptation. You can't absolve yourself of your responsibility for sin by saying, the desire for sin inside of me is not really me. That's foreign to me, alien to me. No, that's you. It is inside of you. Well, I, I don't know where that thought came from. I don't know where that desire originated, but I'm not responsible for it. Please. You think you know your heart? You don't know your heart. Your heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? If it comes from inside of you, it is coming from your heart. Don't insult your creator by saying you have a desire coming from inside of you, but you're not responsible for it. Where did this temptation come from? You need to look no further than your own deceptive heart. The point here, James's, James's point is to fasten moral responsibility on the individual. Sin always starts within you. Not the devil, not your ex-husband, not your siblings, not the people you work with. Until you acknowledge the primary source is you, you're never going to truly acknowledge your sin. Some people say, 
Well, it's only sin, Kyle, if it comes out. Temptation on the inside, sin on the outside. Well, John Calvin would disagree. John Owen would disagree. But the Roman Catholics would agree. It's, it's not wrong. It only becomes wrong if it's acted upon. Well, I disagree. The desire is a temptation to further sin. Even if you did not bid the desire or welcome the desire, Jesus told the Pharisees, the outside of your cup is clean. The inside is dirty. Outward you are beautiful. Inwardly you are filthy. Jesus proclaimed in Mark 7, from men's hearts come evil thoughts. Well, I didn't ask for these evil thoughts. They still came from within you. Craving something inappropriate is sin. When desire is bent in the wrong direction, it is sin. The evil desire tugging away at us is our own. The desire to sin wells up inside us. James is telling them not to blame God for the sins they are desiring. It's your fault. You are responsible for the desires lurking in your heart. Now, I gave you a truth about God's character. God is untemptable by evil. Sin holds no attraction to him. Now I will give you a truth about man's sin. A truth about man's sin. Sin comes from within you. Every sin is an inside job. Sin comes from within you. Every sin is an inside job. Temptation cannot be laid at the feet of God. When you see the flow here, verse 14, a wicked desire, out of which flows, verse 15, a wicked action. The desire is sin in verse 14. The action is sin in verse 15. The inner defection leads to the outer de defection. Verse 15. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. Let's stop here. We have a metaphor a desire becomes pregnant and gives birth. The desire. You need to have it. You've got to have it. A desire to acquire, achieve, or possess something. A desire to be pleasured. A desire to be comforted. Your evil desire meets a man called opportunity. You act on the desire with opportunity and out comes a baby. It's a picture of childbirth. The word conceive here is, is when the sin is entertained and cherished. It is kept safe inside. It is pampered. It forms and develops for nine months. It's bound inside, but sooner or later, that baby is coming out head first. This is pregnant lust birthing sin. A sin is born. A sin is born. It was still sin in the womb, in the thought life, but it's out now. Just as a child is alive before birth, so sin is alive before the actual moment of its birth. We are in the delivery room. The baby has been delivered. Then we quickly go from the delivery room to this baby being full grown. Verse 15. Then desire when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown. Let's pause here. Sin, like babies, grow big. You indulge it one time to get it out of your system, but then you can't stop. The act gives way to the habit, and the habit forms a way of life. It is easier to fight sin in the embryo stage than in the adult stage. It's easier to fight sin in the desire stage than in the action stage. The process is difficult to stop once it begins. It just keeps growing stronger. Verse 15. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. There are two births here. Sin is born 
Sin is made public. Then sin grows and sin has a child. It's the second birth in the same verse. Sin has, sin births a monstrous offspring, his name, death. You simply must plot the fulfillment of the embryo desire. It results in death. The sin you are keeping inside, in your mind, in your thought life, in your desires will lead to death. Sin grows up and becomes a parent. A parent to death. This is more than death of the body. This is death of the soul. Spiritual death in the end. You think it will bring you pleasure, but when it is finished, it only brings death. If allowed to pursue its gravitational inclination like water, it will run downhill. Once the process is set in motion, it takes over. You can only be a fun-loving sinner for so long. Soon the bill must be paid. The final installment, spiritual death at the day of judgment. Sin never shows us the result of taking the bait. Your desire may seem harmless, but it leads to death. This is when desire destroys. Your so-called innocent desire is a fatal attraction. Three generations, parent, child, grandchild. Parent, the desire, child, the public sin, grandchild, death. Three mutant generations. Kevin DeYoung says all three stages, desire, sin, death, are all rightly called sin. Like embryo, baby, adult are all rightly called life. Christian, kill sin at the desire stage. Destroy your sin so your soul can escape. J.C. Ryle wrote a wonderful little book for young men. And in it, he said, Habits, like trees, are strengthened by age. A little child may bend an oak when it is a sapling. A hundred strong men cannot root it up when it is a full-grown tree. Kill sin in the desire stage. All right, class. Our midterm review. Let's go over what we've covered so far. Our passage began with outer troubles, verses 12 and 13, and then moved to inner temptations, verses 14 and 15. Our text started with long-term trials, then progressed to short-term temptations. Rest in this promise of Scripture. God will try you. He will not tempt you. Rest in this promise of Scripture. Now recognize your pattern of sin. Here's the pattern of sin. It begins with desire. It moves to deception. It results in disobedience. That's the act. It ends with death. My seminary president in teaching this text had this exact same pattern along with about every other commentator I read. It begins with desire. It moves to deception. It results in disobedience. And it always ends with death. It's an inevitable progression. James writes to Christians and asserts, this is how sin works. Stay alert, be mindful, recognize this pattern, don't be caught off guard. It begins with an internal desire, and that internal desire will lure you, drag you away, entice you, ensnare you, then deceive you. I am unmasking sin. This is what it looks like and how it operates. James exposes the pattern. He points out the trap. The origin of sin, your heart. The pattern of sin, desire, deception, disobedience, death. And beloved, I want you to recognize your pattern of sin. And I want to take some time here to help you do that. No fish swims around and thinks, I can't wait to bite a hook. Give me a metal hook. 
They don't see the hook until it's too late. The hook is covered by the lure. Something, something that is meant to attract. What is the lure in your life? What is promising a good meal? What is promising satisfaction? What is it that you are asking? Should I swim after that? Should I pursue that? It's promising pleasure. It's promising release. Is it a way for you to maintain control? Alcohol, sex, materialism, shopping, manipulation, eating. The movement is catching your eye, glimmering in the sun. God is saying, don't swim after that. Swim after me. This passage should teach you how to triumph over temptation. The steps you need to take to ward off sin. Is it pornography that is luring you, enticing you, dragging you away? What is it that is saying, eat this fruit and you'll be better off? Eve left room for the devil's words. She entertained them because she didn't want to be rude. What fleeting pleasure is whispering to you, come after me? Come after me. Is the lure for you ambition, popularity, desire for revenge? Whatever sin you're flirting with, whatever deception you're buying into, you are very quickly becoming enslaved, consumed, addicted. That sin is becoming an oak tree of habit. It could be a shortcut, a compromise, a sinful stress reliever, some replacement for God. Embarrassing information can tempt you to lie. Financial struggles out of business can tempt you to alter the numbers. Feeling self-conscious can tempt you to do what the masses are doing. And by the way, don't excuse your lure by judging someone else's lure. There, there are different lures for different people. What, where their lure is approval of people and gambling and suicide? Mine's not that. Your bait may be different, but it's still a lure that you are biting. What sin have you been taking to the baseball game and sharing nachos with? Frustration and discouragement? could send you to the lure. I am never more tempted than when I am discouraged. How do you overcome sin's attractions? Well, you arrest your thoughts. You stop watching the movie. You, you confess the sin and ask someone to keep you accountable. You remove that sin from your face, your house, your phone, your daily life. If you are giving yourself to sin, I plead with you to stop. For the sake of your eternal soul, stop. Do not coddle your sin. Do not find people who will excuse your sin and rationalize your responsibility away. Well, come cry on my shoulder. Answer these questions this afternoon. What temptations are you regularly battling? What temptations are you regularly battling? How often are you giving in to them? How can you kill them? What steps do I need to take to not put them before my face? My plea to you, beloved, is to fight temptation like a baby bird and then fight temptation like a soaring eagle. Fight temptation like a baby bird, then fight temptation like a soaring eagle. I remember reading this in one of the books that has really impacted me. It says, imagine that a baby bird falls from its nest in the sight lines of a fox. The bird cannot yet fly, hence the fall. 
but there is a small protective hole at the base of the tree that is within a scurry's reach. The fox pounces and sets out after the bird. What should the little bird do? Well, of course, it should scamper into the hole to get out of immediate danger. But if, as time goes on, the bird, all he ever does is scamper, it will never learn what it was designed for, to fly. And eventually, it will surely be eaten by the predators it is designed to escape. In the short run, we should simply obey God because it is right. It is his right and it is his due. But in the long run, the ultimate way to shape our lives and escape the deadly influences of our besetting sins is to move the heart with the gospel. Now that's helpful. Such evasive tactics are necessary when you are entrenched in some deep sin. Extreme actions required. But as you grow in Christ, as you learn to fly, you fight temptation in new ways. If you want to break the hold that one beautiful object has on your soul, you simply show the soul a more beautiful object. Like an eagle, you soar high to behold the beauties of Christ and your desires begin to change as you behold the Savior. Thomas Chalmers wrote a book called The Explosive Passions of New Affections. That's what that is. The explosive passions of new affections. As you cultivate godly desires, it kills evil ones. Christian, if you have fallen into sin at the desire stage or at the action stage, there is still hope for you. God made a way that you can go home. He made a way things can be made right. If you have failed to resist and instead entertained, he's giving you mercy right now to repent, to confess your sin quickly and explicitly. There is no better moment in the Christian life than the moment right after repentance. View repentance as a win. If you sin and repent, that's a win. If you have repented of that sin, there is no longer any need to further stew over it. Well, God is, God is disgusted with me now. Repenting one. Jesus knew what he was buying on the cross. All the disgust of God for you was placed on Christ at the cross. Rest in the promise of scripture. Recognize your pattern of sin. Finally, revel in the power of the sovereign. Verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. James is involved in the ministry of undeception. That's what every pastor is involved in. The ministry of undeception. He calls these Christians by a term of endearment. And with a loving and kind heart, he pleads, don't be deceived. Don't be led astray. Because you can be led astray while attending church every Sunday. He strikes a note of urgency. This is an imperative. There's an exclamation point. Don't kid yourself, folks. This is not talking about external deception. Something out there deceiving you. It's talking about internal deception. Middle voice, don't mislead yourself. In what ways can we mislead ourselves? In what ways are we involved in self-deception? Verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. This is how we deceive ourselves. Thinking that God is the source of bad gifts instead of good gifts. God says, I'm not the source of temptation. I am the source of all good. I am not the source of badness. I'm the only source of goodness. One of Satan's prime tactics is to get you to doubt the goodness of God. Because it is impossible to walk with God while you question his goodness. Temptation springs from within. Good gifts spring from above. 
James made you take a hard look at temptation. Now he will make you take a hard look at God. The self-deception happens when we forget how bad we are and how good God is. God doesn't send bad gifts. He only sends good gifts. See the bounty of God. God doesn't send bad gifts. He only sends good gifts. See the bounty of God. How can God's goodness help us resist sin? Eve was asked, does God love you? Jesus was told by Satan, if your father loves you, the goodness of God is the medicine to cure temptation, is the antidote to kill the poison. The beginning of verse 17 again, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. James is insisting that God sends what is good, not what is evil. Nothing comes from God that isn't good. The food you, you will eat this afternoon cascaded down from the Father. His hand sent to your plate. Your children are a gift from Him. Your spouse is a gift from Him. Your parents are a gift from Him. That breath you just took is a gift from Him. The ability to read and speak is a gift from Him. The endless gifts cascading down from the Father. Good God doesn't send bad gifts. He only sends good gifts. See the bounty of God. God doesn't change. He remains the same. See the constancy of God. Verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. God created the lights. Sun, moon, stars, fireballs in the sky. You see the creative activity of God by looking at the lights. He orders them and sustains them. Notice it did not say falling down, showing randomness. Rather coming down, showing purposefulness. He charts the course of these gifts. He sends these gifts on purpose to specific addresses. James reminds us God is committed to giving us what is truly good. If it comes from him, it is never a trap. It is never death. It's always life. Verse 17 continues, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. <laughs> God doesn't change. He doesn't vary. He doesn't yo-yo. God is immutable. No changeableness, no variableness in him. The whole universe is a swirl of motion, a swirl of variation. But there is no variation with God. God is unalterably good. This shadow, due to change, is speaking of astronomical phenomenons. The, the shadow caused by an object moving or turning. The shadows cast by the various phases or movements or rotations of the earth. This is an astronomical change. What is commonplace in astronomy is never true of God. The most stable thing we know in the universe shifts. Everything changes except for God. He's not a shadow that bobs and weaves. Saints, enjoy a deep-seated conviction of the absolute, unchanging goodness of God. His goodness never lengthens or shortens. He's not moody or capricious. This is the idea of the constancy of God. The character of God is not subject to change. While the earth is constantly shifting, God never shifts. God's goodness cannot be eclipsed. And we found the perfect spot to bask in his goodness. James distinguishes God from the luminaries he created. He is unchangingly good. And this is good news for us, beloved, because we are as changeable as he is changeless. His goodness is not only undeserved, but it's unchanging. God doesn't send bad gifts. He only sends good gifts. See the bounty of God. That's verse 16. God doesn't change. He remains the same. See the constancy of God. That's verse 17. You don't birth yourself. God births you. See the salvation of God. Verse 18. I look forward to making some of you mad right here. Verse 18. Of his own will, he brought us forth 
by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. It, here, it's almost as if James says, and let me take you right to the top of the list. I'll show you the best gift that came down from the Father of lights, the most supreme good of God's goodness, of his will, he brought us forth. Now, that's talking about the new birth. That's talking about salvation. That's the work of a generation. Were you brought forth by your own will? No. Our salvation comes from God's choice. His will. There are no other influences except his own purpose. God's sovereign choice is rooted in his own determination. Now there is mystery here. But what is not a mystery is that the initiative in our salvation is God's. Charles Spurgeon, who pastored in London, I talk about him way too much, said, and I quote, I believe the doctrine of election because I am quite certain that if God had not chosen me, I should have never chosen him. And I am sure he chose me before I was born or else he would never have chosen me afterwards. And he must have elected me for reasons unknown to me for I never could find in myself why he should have looked upon me with special love. So I am forced... He did it grudgingly. I am forced to accept the great biblical doctrine of election. End quote. When you first discover election, it seems scary. But then as you grow, it seems glorious. There's an election in the Old Testament and there's an election in the New Testament. The same election. The election of Israel had nothing to do with them. They didn't earn it. It came down upon them. Our election is the same. There is no more comforting doctrine than election. He brought us forth. Did we bring ourselves forth? No. Having purposed, he birthed us. This is God's initiative in causing us to be born again. No child has ever been born into the world by his own will or plan. And the same for the Christian. Regeneration is not an act that you start. You cannot decide when to be born again. You can't birth yourself. One pastor said, I've heard salvation presented like we were drowning in our sin, calling out for help, and Jesus came along in a lifeboat and said, hey, do you want some help? And we said, yes, please. I'm tired of being in this ocean, and I want to be up in the boat with you. And Jesus threw us a line. Now, that's beautiful. But that's not correct according to James. When Jesus came to us, we were already face down in the water no longer breathing and without a pulse. And God pulled us into the boat and breathed new life into us. Of his own will, he brought us forth. James wants the scattered churches to know how they were saved. You may remember the very minute you chose him. That's wonderful. I want you to realize before you chose him, he chose you. The decision was his. Before the decision was ours. Verse 18. Of his own will he brought us forth. Now how we brought forth? By the word of truth. What was the means or instruments God used to bring about new birth to these people scattered in the Mediterranean world? The word of truth. The gospel. The expression word of truth that only shows up five times in the New Testament and every time it refers to the gospel. Now, church, I gave you a truth about God's character, a truth about man's sin. Now I want to give you a truth about FFC's preaching. A truth about FFC's preaching. We value the preaching event because through it, people are redeemed. We value the preaching event because through it, people are redeemed. Through the preaching of the word, we are enlightened. The word gives birth to people. People can be sitting in the church, listening to the preached word, and then suddenly, they believe. They are born again. This is the power of the word. Non-Christian, non-Christian, you must be born from above, not just your mother's womb. You are not saved if you have not had this new birth. Take notice of the reproductive language. When you are born again, you don't get smarter. You get the righteousness of Christ. The new birth is unseen by human eye, but experienced by the human heart. 
Here's how salvation happens. God opens your eyes to your sin. You begin to feel dirty before a completely holy, clean God. You desire to make things right. You go to God repenting of your sin and calling on Jesus Christ to save you. That is when the Spirit of God moves into your soul. The new birth happens when God the Father acknowledges a person's belief in the gospel and credits to him the full righteousness of Jesus Christ. If you truly see your sin, God opens your eyes to rightly see your sin. So run to Christ right now. Non-Christian, right now. Wash in the cleansing blood that is Christ's precious blood. When God saves us, he makes us, this verse says, a kind of first fruits. That we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. The first fruits in the Old Testament were when a farmer went out and brought some stuff from the field home to his wife and said, Here, this is the beginning of the harvest. The first fruits were a guarantee of many more to come. Harvest isn't over. When God saves us, he says, this is the first fruits. The first installment of a harvest coming. More is to come from God. All over the world, God is bringing people in. And you may experience it happening this morning. We are the first installment of the new creation. The rest of creation still awaits. We are the first step in his remaking of the universe. Now, I'm going to close in like 15 minutes. No, I'm joking. It's just going to be in a few minutes. The whole story of the Bible is a story of temptation. Adam was tempted in the garden. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. And I want to point out that their temptation was different than ours but they still represent us fully and sufficiently. You may have had your curiosity peaked in the text where it said God can't be tempted with evil and wondered how Jesus, who was God, is God, was tempted in the wilderness. Your temptation is a lure from the inside. Jesus' temptation was a lure from the outside. There is a difference. Temptation is a sinful desire. Temptation as a sinful desire welling up in you. And that way, Jesus never had that. Jesus did not have fleshly desires. He did not have sinful thoughts. His temptation was real, but it was from the outside, not the inside. Adam's experience of temptation was also from the outside. The first time. All the other times, it was from the inside. Our lead pastor, Daniel Hurd, says it like this. Adam was not born in sin and thus he like Jesus was incapable of experiencing inward temptation but both Adam and Jesus were still fit to fully represent us before God now this is good news because we needed someone to face the lure from the outside and come away with no sin and we also needed someone who never faced the lure from the inside because he is God in the flesh Jesus Christ is the best gift that ever came down from the Father of lights. Let's pray. Father of lights, we sense that your man James has spoken to our condition. We leave this passage with no excuse for our sin. We plead the righteousness of the one who never had a sinful desire. The lure never captured him because love captured him. Love for you and love for us. Oh, what love that would bring him to die on a cross. Oh, what power that would bring him out of a tomb. Amen.